Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome Hitesh Mehta, one of our Tapas Communities and Heritage Working Group members, who's going to be sharing about his project in Nabosha Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya. Thank you so much, Hitesh. Thank you, Sue. Um, my presentation is going to be uh, titled uh, Integrated Biodiversity, Pastoralism, and Tourism Development Master Plan for Nabosha Wildlife Conservancy. Sorry, I think something uh, thing is not. You need to ahead. just click uh, click on the presentation, yeah, and then it'll go. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction of myself. Uh, as I tell people, my soul is from India, my heart is from Kenya, and for the Kenyans in this group, I'm a one inch into Kufu, uh, and my body lives and works in Florida. By profession, I wear quite a few hats. I'm a protected area physical planner. I'm an authentic ecotourism uh, a pioneer and planner. Uh, I do research uh, and write articles. I'm an author, an adjunct professor. And by profession, I am a qualified eco architect and a qualified landscape architect, etc. cetera. Um, I run an office, a multidisciplinary holistic practice that started in Nairobi in 1990. And uh, our philosophy is very simple. Right from day one of our planning process, homo sapiens, flora and fauna all get equal attention. It is a practice that believes in the philosophy of ego less, but eco more. A philosophy that says that the Homo sapiens species is not a superior species and should not be above every other species. We are part of nature and we are part of all the species. And so everybody gets equal attention, every animal. We learned over many years that just by taking care of financial parts, environmental and social aspects, you will not get sustainability unless you take care of the spiritual aspect. So we promote and practice a, a, an approach called quadruple bottom line ap approach to planning and design. Spiritual. Uh, we are not talking about Allah and Muhammad and uh, Christ, etc. We are talking about the energies that are embodied on a site and how to harness them. The stewardship in our office is a committed, conscious, straight from the soul effort to take long term care of terrestrial and marine ecosystems and respect the spiritual beliefs of indigenous peoples that live in and around them. So on any, for most of our projects, we are, we have been at least taking care of six of the SDGs, life on land, life below water, no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, and climate action, which actually takes care of, quite, you know, is connected to quite a few of the others that I mentioned. So, I guess you know I'm, I'm speaking to the crowd here, but you know we are not in climate change era. We are in a state of climate emergency where our planet is not in the general ward at all. It's moved, and it is in the ICU and on a respirator. So what we have been doing for almost 15 years is we have been working with indigenous communities all around the world. You can see them on the red dots on this map. And we have been working on issues related to sea level rise, food security, flooding, desertification, and carbon sequestration. What I'm going to do today is to take one of those case studies, one of those projects, and go into detail. I want to take you to my home uh, and several of your homes as well, to one of the most beautiful parts of the planet, 
the area between Kenya and Tanzania and that ecosystem. As we speak right now, there are 1.3 million zebra, uh, wildebeest and zebras, etc., other ungulates crossing the, uh, uh, you know, from, from Tanzania and coming into the Masai Mara National Reserve. This photograph, it's actually a video, but you guys can't see it. But uh, this video was taken just eight hours ago. And, you know, this is the largest mammal migration on the planet. But also happening at about the same time is the Loita migration, which is zero point, about approximately 0 0.2 million species. And right there in the heart of this whole ecosystem is the Naboisho Wildlife Conservancy. And you can see its importance when it comes to the migrations of the, uh, the wildebeest and the zebras, etc. This is the home of the Koyaki Maasai people. And uh, it used to be actually called the Koyaki Ranch. And then you, I'll show you what they did with it. Uh, one of the more beautiful parts of Africa, some of the most amazing sunsets that you will get. And what these guys did, the, the Koyaki people, they took their whole ranch, which is 50,000 acres or 20,000 hectares, and they cut it up into pieces. You can see them uh, a little bit on the screen, but I'm going to go into detail. And they were cut up in, in uh, parts of land of between 50 to 100 acres. And so each family got this. Now, you know what happens with the Maasai. Each Maasai family has, you know, their cash crop, their god, the cows. And, you know, there are lots of them. And over time, what has happened was the, the cows had eaten a lot of the grass up. And, it, you know, there was already a little bit of desertification taking place, especially when there, were no, there was no rains. It was a really big problem. The Maasai, a very intelligent and a very wise uh, uh, community, they decided they brought in some tourism partners. Uh, and they said, listen, if you guys can bring in tourism, build some camps here and bring some money, and, and we have a deal, what we will do is we will leave this whole area and we will go next door. And so then these tourism partners brought my office and we became the protected area planners. And of course the integrated master planners. And so what I did is because we, we practice an approach called collective creativity. creativity. We want to make sure we bring in all the wisdom and the knowledge from day one of the project. So when it came to the formal sort of knowledge, I brought in uh, ornithologists, uh, botanists, uh, mammal experts, and hydrologists to the team. And one of the first things we did, uh, or in fact, the florist did, the, the flora expert, is to do a sense of place study of all the flora of this uh, uh, conservancy. Uh, uh, Joseph, your colleague, I don't know if you know her, Dr. Najma Darani, she's a senior lecturer at, uh, Jomo, at the Kenyatta University. She's considered the foremost botanist in Kenya, has written, has written several books on indigenous species. And we asked her to do a very detailed study of the different ecosystems of the conservancy. But more than that, we asked her to do a very detailed sort of table and list of the English name, the Maasai name, the scientific names of each uh, plant that grows on the, on, on the property, the growth forms, the, it's its status when it comes to conservation, and its socioeconomic benefits and uses. So we are now connecting that ecosystem with the local people, and we are connecting it, of course, with the, with the fauna and the avifauna. We then, we are also brought in uh, 
Dr. Munir Virani, uh, a, a good colleague of mine, a good friend, and who is considered one of the world's top most vulture experts and a, and, and a raptor expert. So he came in and also did a very detailed list of uh, over 145 bird species. And of course, all the comments and whether on the IUC in list, whether they are of least concern or whether they are threatened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We then also had Professor Ara Monajem from the Zulu uh, from Zululand, and he is a small mammal expert. Has written a couple of books on the subject, and so we are now slowly beginning to build an inventory of flora and fauna. And then we brought a local Mike Thomas. Uh, to do a water resource development plan, because one thing in the Mara that is extremely important, especially for the local communities, is uh, water as a, as a resource, especially drinking water. And he, Mike, Mike did a very detailed study of all this. So when we, when I went on site and my team as, a, as, as the protected area planners, we now had all this information. And so then we spent about five days just trying to understand the cultural landscape of the Maasai. And when went into their maniatas to try to understand their connection to the land, their connection to their livestock. And we asked them to take us through the property so that we could see the land through their eyes, hear it through their ears, taste it through their mouths and our mouths as well. And this gentleman who is next to me is a Dorobo. Uh, he's a particular uh, part of the Koyaki people. These guys have the with the other guy have the closest connection to our ancestors. His wisdom is like no other. You will not find it in any university of any professor on the planet. And we wanted to use that wisdom right from the beginning. Here he's showing us the medicinal plants of his people. He's showing us the traditional hunting grounds. Now, as you know, in Kenya, we banned hunting in 1978. Hunting also for the local communities. Of course, in, in the, in the, in, uh, especially in the protected areas. And then we decided to go and interview and embed ourselves into the local community to meet with the women to 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 meet with the kids and take notes we just went there there with just our ears and at night we would sit around the fireplace and listen to their to their oral stories stories that have been passed on for generations and for which there is no written stuff in the libraries. And once we build their trust, we started getting closer to understand the patterns of the Maasai peoples and the colors and the combination and their dancing and their symbologies and their sacred areas. Like this is a sacred hill to the Maasai community. And we wanted, we started doing research and studying the connections of the Maasai, the spiritual connections of the Maasai with their landscape. That is when we now start putting everything on the drawing table and we bring them on day one. Not day 150, not after two years, but from day one. So you can be the, the, the largest, the, the, the biggest authority on the planet, but when it comes to the land of the Maasai, they are the authority. And you've got to have your ego at a zero level. And then we have done all of this. We are also working on the latest in technology, the latest in ArcView GIS technology for us to truly understand and study how the ecosystems are on the whole site. We then make a presentation to this group 
uh, at the Koyaki Wildlife School, which I believe up to now is the only indigenous wildlife school on the planet. I may be wrong, but it's it, it, it's actually located in the Naboishi Conservancy, and you can see how many women there are, and they're all going to end up, of course, being guides. You meet with the managers of the whole conservancy, people who manage the infrastructure on a daily basis, and we try to understand their whole approach to infrastructure. And then when we start starting to work on the design, you can see when your drawing tables are in nature and you are working, you become a lot more sensitive designer. If you start doing these drawings when, in, when you are in your office in Joburg or Cape Town or Nairobi or, or Washington, D.C., I can tell you it cannot be as sensitive. And, and then you go back to the, uh, to the, the wise people and you sit with them and you confirm what you have done and you exp they explain to you and they correct you. They, may, they, 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 they show you your mistakes. This is something that we have developed over the years. We call it community empowerment through the planning process. We give the indigenous communities the pens, the markers, the pencils, and we ask them to draw with us as a team as an equal partner. And it is then when we begin to start highlighting and identifying where the Maasai do their spiritual ceremonies, where they have their male bonding places, where they have their sacred areas. And they are the ones who actually drew this up and put it up. We then start doing a little bit better drawings, take it to the next level, a little bit more detail. And once it is all confirmed by them is when we create this physical integrated master plan, which when you saw shows, when you see a detail of it, this is like a painting of, like a, a Monet painting or a Van Gogh painting. There are about seven to eight different uh, layers on this particular drawing. And it's all done by hand, not done digitally. And you can see when you look at the legend, there is actually a mention of the cultural sites. When it comes to the hydrology aspects, you can see some of those blue dot areas. The hydrologists suggested we create a little dams so we collect water during the rainy season and we make sure uh, and, and then we had pipes running from there and, and to the villages. So the local villages all got fresh water coming straight from the conservancy. Because of the drought related problems, we have what you call controlled grazing. So whereby the Maasai from the villages will bring their cattle only in areas that have been shown to them during the dry season. So it's not like this is a keep off zone. In fact, it's the contrary. You, you can come in and when, when, it's, when there are serious problems and you can use certain areas. And this controlled grazing areas are rotated so that the grass remains always fresh. We then started working on the main entrance gates. This is where the tourism component comes in because you want to make sure that you create a feeling of a destination. So you have this you know, a well done uh, statement, uh, entrance gates. We are using technology um, of the, uh, the warden's houses uh, and everything just like as if you were from far looks like a Maasai Manyata kind of building. So this is a concept called continuity of the vernacular. We are using the construction techniques of the Maasai and the materials to create modern buildings. And so then we have this uh, program that we have developed. And the first phase was the base camp wilderness lodge. This is a lodge which now is now been renamed the Eagle View Camp. You can see here the close up of that physical master plan. 
You can see the level of detail that goes into this master plan. It even shows some of the most important trees, the landmark trees, shows you where the hippo pools are, uh, the drainage areas, the trails, uh, the, the different gradation of roads, etc. all the infrastructure. And this is a lodge that is 100% owned by the Koyaki Maasai. You can see the state it was in. It had not been well maintained. This was an entrance to one of the units. This was their laundry. And so they came to us and says, could you please, of course they were getting funded by, by the Norwegian bank. And they said, could you please help us totally upgrade this property and make it into a five star, well, a, more like a four star, um, you know, uh, tented camp property. So I brought in all consultants. We like to work with local consultants, people on the ground. And in this case, of course, I was, I'm Kenyan. So now we are talking about 100% local consultants working on this project. The architects, in fact, the one on the right is, uh, was a student of mine from the University of Nairobi, runs a very successful practice. We now go just into that site and we start working on our research and we're doing studies, site analysis studies. We go back to the owners, we talk to them, we discuss. We go back to the drawing board and we also use computers. So it is a mix of drawing board and the latest in technology. And we present it to the tourism partners who are going to be operating the launch because they are also an equal and important part of the process. We then go back to the drawing board. And this is how the process, this community empowerment process, this ego-less process is used. And these are the staff of that property. They're all Maasai. We wanted to make sure that even when they are in this property, they feel and they, they, they look at it as home. So our whole concept of this property was like as if it was a Maasai Maniata, where the main entry comes into an area in the central area where uh, you will be, get, be dropped off as a tourist. This is the drop off area and that will embody or, or, or represent the, the cow's enclosure. And then from there you go to your different units. And then when you, when you now then we use the latest in modern technology to create a sexy looking master plan, which is what you then use uh, to sell this project or to uh, show it as a marketing thing and to win awards, etc. So this is what we did to show to the Maasai what this whole pro and the tourism operators what this property will look like when it is done and redone. The, uh, the addition of an infinity swimming pool where you have this amazing biophilic connection with the animals and the water hole, the natural water hole that's right at the bottom. This is the finished product. You can see, you know, one of the best locations and views you will find in the whole Mara ecosystem and that total connection you have from the public spaces. And we also designed the, the units in such a way that you can just have that very innate connection with animals and know at the same time that they will not be attacking you or there's anything of danger. That is now using modern technology to create what does, you know, some of these villas will look like. Again, using a Maasai vernacular architecture as a way to help us come up with something is uh, you know modern. Uh, these are AutoCAD plans, uh, and what we did was we made sure that not one single tree was cut. On the contrary, ten thousand species of trees, native species, were planted on this project. And so, when you have the finished product, you can see the acacias and uh, candelabras and all these plants all are doing very well. And that's when you have that harmony of architecture and the landscape. Even for the animals, there is, uh, they are very uh, uh, comfortable that they don't have very uh, ugly buildings uh, and, and reflection coming in from the buildings. 
So for the tourists and even for the animals, the experience is fantastic because there's no intrusion by the architecture. And if you're having breakfast, you can see uh, the connection that you have. Even when you are in your units, you can be just sitting, having a, a cup of masala chai, and you have got your Dorobo guide, and there you, you are in, with your binoculars, and that's the experience you get. A day after I took this uh, photograph, uh, there was a family of five lions walking right in front. So at the end, we are talking about a win, 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 a quadruple win. The wild animals that had been chased away by the by the by the cattle by the cows have now returned back, and they are very uh, happy. They are not skittish. They are taking their time and they are enjoying it so much so that you can sit and start sketching them. And this is when you have a spiritual communion with these animals. When you sit with your drawing pencils and you start drawing them. An iPhone or a Samsung will not give you this experience. From 2014 to 2017, there was a 72% increase in the number of elephants in this conservancy. And of course, with all the ungulates, the carnivores are back. And the herbivores, the herbivores, the, the carnivores are back. Simba is back to his territory. And with Simba have come the eagles, giraffes, the gazelles. Shenzi is also there and then create that whole circle of life. And for the tourists, this is what they're paying for. That once in a lifetime, this amazing savanna sunset, sundowner, where you can have your gin and tonic and watch the sun set in the savanna. For the locals, you know, one of the few places you are going to find female indigenous guides anywhere in the world. And they are able to share with you their sacred sites, their, their sacred hills. And at the end of the month, it's Hakuna Matata. Because every single member of the community, and especially the parents and some of the kids, they have got their cell phones and through M-Pesa, their money going directly from the tourists through the tourism operators straight into their bank accounts. They're, continue, they're able to continue their normal livelihoods, but yet also be making money out of their land. For so the cows is happiness as well, because the conservancy has become a carbon bank. So whenever there is a drought, now the the cows and the other wild anim the wild animals are able to live in harmony. Before that was not the case. I end my presentations with some financials because this is a very important part, and I know some of you are doing some research. So this uh, the, the, the Marana Boisho is a, is a model champion of uh, the concept called economic equality. So which which, which means that the list we is determined by the size of the area, not the nature of the land. So that means that the families who are, happen to be given less productive land are not left behind. The leases, the tourism operators, are for 15 years. And you can see that each household is guaranteed an annual lease fee of $85 per acre. And then, of course, it's adjusted to cover uh, inflation. You know, 8% annual inflation. And the the, two, the five to experience two ecotourism operators now actually it's now become six with uh, Great Plains has, has now been an addition here. 
and you can see, you know, we're talking about eight, eight camps and uh, lodges. So it's about almost 185, maybe 200, uh, between 180 to 200 new jobs have been, I mean, jobs have been created. I would say about 95% are all local. And the, you, as I mentioned to you, the list fee is paid directly into individual bank accounts. There is total transparency. The management company, I showed you photographs of them. They are the ones who are the ones who collect the, the income, uh, you know, the lease fees. And, and they are the ones who uh, are enforce the rate collection uh, from the tourism operators. And this is the most important part. I know this uh, uh, for a long time, you know, this process of public-private partnership didn't work. But in this case, the rent is calculated on a fixed sum per each bed night, whether it is sold or not. And of course, you know, it's been working very well, except when you have situations like COVID, which has been a real problem. It's been a problem all over the world. And for this, the tourism operators actually organized philanthropy and they managed to get all their money from philanthropy rather than from day guests. So you can imagine over this period of 15 years, the local community will be earning 17 million, a minimum of 17 million US dollars with an average income per landowner just for lease fees of $2,000 annually. So you can see there is a, a guaranteed income for almost 600 uh, Maasai households and 80, 80 US dollars from every bed night goes directly to landowners and, and, and uh, operations. There's also $100 uh, from uh, uh, the tourism fees that is going towards the conservation aspect of the land as well. And, you know, as I said, when you, the, uh, the local people are also making money uh, to, by, by working at these properties. So you can see when you, when you do, uh, as I say, that if you build your foundations well, you're going to have a good uh, how a roof that sits well and a house will not be broken down so you can see the process that has taken place and you can see the recognitions and awards that go by it the eagle view camp has now become the only property in the whole of africa that has been used as a case study by the landscape architecture foundation here in the usa uh marana boisho has won a united nations award uh, it has uh, uh, won uh, the uh, awards by the African uh, Responsible Tourism Awards, uh, the Sustainable Destinations Top 100 uh, Award. Uh, the, the Eagle Camp has won an award of excellence here in Florida. And in the early years, I don't know what the latest status is, but Maron Aboisha was one of the early pilot studies for the GSTC. So when you look at this whole uh, Mara Conservancy, and I know this, there are pros and cons uh, about this whole concept and idea, but for now, when we talk about the importance of tourism, and I'm talking eco-tourism, I'm not talking sustainable tourism, because there's a huge difference between the two. Eco-tourism, when we start looking at it here, where all of these conservancies have got a limited number of camps and beds and how they are all getting connected with the wildlife corridors and how the local people have been benefiting. I, I, I personally am just looking at it from where, where Naboisho is, you can see that, that there are a huge benefits from involving local communities from day one of the process for making sure that there is a financial, a fixed and confirmed financial benefits to them. And this is a, a more recent article uh, that actually says that indigenous communities that have depended on tourism have admirably refused to turn to illegal wildlife trade as a source of income during the pandemic. I'm sure there have been several examples that, that actually would contest this, but generally uh, we have, there's been some good, uh, you know, positive outcomes even during the uh, uh, pandemic. 
So that's the end of my presentation. I'm, I'm leaving my email uh, there uh, just in case you guys need other, have any other questions about this or uh, you know want to use this case study for your books or for your papers or or anything. Uh, I'm, I'm happy uh, to be of help. Thank you so much, Hitesh. That was fantastic. Um, it's making me miss the bush even more, seeing all those photos of the beautiful Mara.